Welcome. Uh, I'm posting a, uh, a lecture uh, by request from a Series 7 candidate. His question was, Dean, is there any mnemonics or that can help me with my memory work on the Series 7? You know, the three styles of questions you get are recognition, memory questions like when do options expire, practical application, you know, like current yield. Can't be giving those up. And then the last style of question you get are judgment questions. And so he was testing uh, pretty soon. And I said, yes, indeed, I do have some mnemonics that uh, I'll share with you and I'll post on the YouTube channel. I also have some test taking tricks. Uh, it's better to learn the information, but you know, when all else fails, a test taking trick is not bad. So we'll go over some test taking tricks. So two parts here, first few slides are some mnemonics you might wanna have. You know, our, our time together is a buffet. So if you don't like something uh, on the buffet line, don't put it on your tray. And that's the same with series seven coaching. I mean, if so you don't like something, you know, you can always swap, swap left instead of right. Uh, be careful on your study effort. You get, don't get too many voices that confuse you. But uh, other than that, uh, let's get started. So the first mnemonic that this uh, might be helpful is how to distinguish between 33 and 34. Those were companion pieces of legislation. I'm not gonna re-lecture uh, those. You can uh, check out my secondary market lecture for a lot of 34 stuff. But 33, if they ask you about paper prospectuses, that's 33. If they ask you about people and places, uh, that is 34. Uh, a good way to remember 144. One, 144, 1% 1 of the outstanding stock or the average of the last four weeks trading volume, whichever is greater up to four times a year. So a great mnemonic is 144. Four, four. That's a mnemonic that reminds us 1%, that's the one, 1% 1 of the outstanding stock or the average of the last four, four weeks trading volume up to four times a year, every 90 days, every 90 days. So it's a good mnemonic. Another way to do that is you can say, well, one plus four plus four is nine and that's every 90 days, but 144. DERP, now DERP versus DREP, be careful. It's more likely you're gonna get DERP than you're gonna get DREP. Uh, DERP is about the secondary market. And DERP reminds us of the chronological sequence of this. And uh, it's very testable to when is the X date? X is Latin for without, right? If I say, do you have a X spouse? That means you're no longer trading with your uh, spouse attached. And there's two test questions. One is, when is it? And the other test question is, what is it? Those are different uh, questions, by the way. And what is it? What is it? Is it the first date? on which the stock no longer trades with a dividend attached. And it's a function of the Uniform Practice Code, secondary trading. The Uniform Practice Code standardizes trading practices within the securities industry. And it's not coincidence. It's not a coincidence that that's a one business day prior to record because regular way settlement is T plus two. So. When is it? It's one business day prior to record. And uh, the test question is the only one that's not set by the board of director. All these other things are set by the board of directors, but not the X date. Now be careful. Sometimes people will say, Dean, I think this thing is a typo and they don't realize what they're looking at is a open end mutual fund where there is no secondary trading. And so all those dates are set by the uh, board of directors and the X date is still the same thing. It's the first date on which the fund no longer has that dividend, but uh, when is it? It is one business day after record date. And all those dates are set by the mutual funds board of directors. And then remember, they're very testable. We have what's called the code of conduct, which standardizes practices, or excuse me, is the ethical behavior that uh, broker dealers and associated persons owe customers. And I can't imagine any draw in which you don't get asked about a violation of the code of conduct called selling dividends. That is a big no-no. Uh, by the way, that would be on all of your exams. And when you go take your follow-on exams like 66 that or 65 or 63, that'll still be there because the state administrator frowns on that as well. That's using the impending X date as an artifice. Don't you love that word, an artifice, an artificial sense of urgency that doesn't exist. So I say, hey, listen, if you buy it today, you get the dividend. But if you wait till tomorrow, no dividend for you. 
He said, well, Dean, uh, you know, wouldn't I be better served to buy this uh, after the X and not create an unnecessary tax situation? I said, well, gee, you're no fun. <laughs> you're going to talk to your supervisor. Uh, no, no, no. Big no, no. Well, let me clear my slides here. Uh, the teeter-totter or seesaw, you see this a lot. This relationship isn't linear, but uh, I love the teeter-totter or seesaw because it turns what are judgment questions into aim and shoot point and click questions. Anytime I can do that, I'm a big fan. You know, there's no draw on your exam in which you're not going to have to take the yield and figure out the price or get the price and figure out the yield. And so one thing you might want to consider in terms of a dad dump sheet is when you come to the exam is to draw a line which represents a bond at par. You know, I've got here on the uh, slide some Ford Motor Company debentures that were recently issued. Uh, Ford issued $8 billion of these debentures in the primary market. They had 10 years to maturity. They were callable in five years at par. And uh, if you buy these bonds brand new, all of these yields are going to be the same. You know, uh, I used to tell my clients when I was a practitioner, let's just buy the bonds the primary market, hold them to maturity, and you know we don't have to worry about the fluctuating interest rates. Now, every quarter, you're getting a statement that, that will reflect a secondary value for the bonds based on interest rates. Uh, we call it also the coupon rate because in the old days, bonds had coupons. You'd literally clip the coupon, take it to the paying agent to get the money. So here, 8% on 1,000 is $80 in annual interest for each of these bonds. You know, the bond could be trading at a premium in the secondary market as a percentage of par. And let's say that interest rates go down, causing the bond to go up, and now it's trading at a premium. What I love about the teeter-totter is it turns what our judgment question is to aim and shoot. You don't have to do the math here. I've done the math on this bond. Uh, but you, know, you just need to know where the numbers are in relationship to each other. You do have to be able to do current yield on the test. That's definitely testable. But uh, with the teeter-totter, you can now rank this from low to high. You can say on the test that yield to call is the lowest yield. And by the way, that's the most testable issue, by the way is this idea that you're not gonna get to hold the bonds perhaps to maturity because it's very likely as it stands today that Ford wants this money back or wants to refinance, call the bonds away from the existing bondholders and refinance this at a lower rate. So that's very testable. So if interest rates go down, one of the risks you have is call risk. And that's actually what I should be quoting to the customer. So you say, hey Dean, I'm considering buying a brand new bond and brand new bonds with similar credit quality to these Ford debentures that are in the secondary market with similar maturity, similar credit are paying, uh, you know, between five and six. And boy, that one pays eight. I said, well, yeah, but you're gonna have to pay a premium if you buy it in the secondary market. And even after paying the premium and, you know, amortizing that over the call, you're losing a hundred dollars to the call date. I'll just assume five years. That's why I did do the math. But if that number is still attractive, well, maybe you still want to consider the bonds. Now, if interest rates go up, then the bond goes down. It's trading at a discount. I did the math there for you. And you say, gee, Dean, this bond only pays eight and brand new ones pay in between nine and 10. I say, but yeah, you get it at a discount. And so, you know, if that is attractive yield, that yield to maturity, then maybe you should consider buying the bonds. Now, the only math that is necessary on the test, you have to be able to do current yield calculations. But other than that, it's just where are these relationships uh, to each other? Now, I have that as a formal lecture in secondary markets. This lecture is just about mnemonics and what you might want to consider putting on a data dump sheet. And I'm suggesting you might want to put a teeter-totter, a flat line when you come in your exam to represent bonds at par. Uh, DI-90 is a mnemonic to remind us about uh, the pass-through, subchapter M, or the pipeline or conduit theory. The D in DI-90 is for dividends on the stocks. The I is interest on the bonds, less the expenses, whatever that is. They have to pass through 90%. Other people's money is count, reminds us of the flow. You know, this is a series seven, so you should probably, your SIE already know what a clearing firm is, but, you know, a clearing firm is a firm that has these departments, an order department, a purchase and sales department, a margin department, a cashiering department. You know, if I can't, if I don't have these departments, that means I'm a, a, a non-clearing firm and I probably hire National Financial or Pershing or somebody to do this for me. But the order department is where it goes first and the order department transmits the order to the appropriate market center for execution. Then it goes to the purchase and sales department who generates the confirmations and uh, matches trades. And then it goes to the margin department who determines whether monies or securities are due. And then it goes to the cashiering department who takes receipt of money and or securities. Uh, pigs and pals is a mnemonic to remind us about passive activity losses 
going with passive income. So when I have a partnership, I either have a partnership direct participation program that is flowing losses through to me or income to me. You know, uh, I sold a lot of partnerships, direct participation programs in my career. And you know, one of my go-to moves was to take you up to the winery and say, hey, let's do a due diligence tour and tasting, you know? And uh, we were on our way back down to the car and the doctor said to me, he said, Dean, he said, you know, it's kind of embarrassing. I appreciate uh, the due diligence tour and tasting, but I will not be investing. And the reason I'll not be investing is because I have, it's embarrassing, all kinds of uh, direct participation programs, partnerships, that are throwing all kinds of losses off to me. And so it would be silly for me to buy yet another partnership. I said, well, uh, doctor, au contraire. In fact, now I think you need to make a bigger asset allocation to the winery because this throws off passive income. You're gonna be receiving cash distributions from this investment and those passive activity losses will shelter that for you. And so you need to make a bigger investment than, than even I thought previously. Now, what how does this amount to is a test question in terms of suitability. I gave you an example of something you can uh, count on perhaps seeing on your draw. A customer has a large amount of passive income. So remember what I'm trying to do is match my pigs with my pals, a passive income generator partnership with a passive activity loss partnership or vice versa or vice versa. And so if you have a large amount of passive income, I might say, hey, why don't we take a flyer on an oil and gas exploratory program? You know, if we do I end up losing money at least we can use those passive activity losses, those pals, to offset our pigs, our passive income. So pigs and pals is just a way to remember uh, that tax consequence of a partnership. By the way, you can't take any losses from the partnership basket of your tax return anywhere else. You know, you have three baskets of uh, taxes on your tax return. You have paycheck, portfolio, and passive. Paycheck, that's earned income, you working for money. Portfolio is your money working for you and on earned income. And then th what we're talking about now, passive. You know, the idea we is we're trying to get enough money working for you. You don't need to work for your money. But remember, you can take up to $3,000 from your portfolio into your paycheck and reduce that. But no, you can't do that with this passive stuff. This one's worth a lot of points. You know, a lot of people who have this mnemonic share it as bliss and slobs. And I always tell people I'm just lazy. I don't need to know what goes on the other side. I'm just going to know the buy limits and sell stops. Whether you want to sell, it says sell stops here, by the way, because remember, there's two versions of a sell stop. There's a sell stop that turns into a market order and a sell stop that turns into a limit order. It doesn't matter if you want a sell stop that turns into a market order or a sell stop that turns into a limit order. It's placed below the market. So that's how I do it. Now, some people, however, like to put on the above, on top of this slobs that always oh, just to turn it into a mnemonic. And that stands for sell limits and buy stops. And again, remember, there's two types of buy stops. There's buy stops that turn into market orders and buy stops that turn into limit orders. Uh, you know, this one, I'm not quite sure how this works, but, you know, BDs, right? Brokers act as agents for commissions. Brokers, let's take our, let's just fill this in. So brokers act as agents for commission. So in any one transaction, that's what we're gonna be doing. Again, I would refer you to my trading thing there, right? And dealers, let's fill that in, dealers act as principals for profit. So that's just a way to remind us of what kind of transaction we're looking at. Now that's markups and markdowns, whatever the case may be. And again, I do a pretty good job, pretty thorough job of that in the secondary market lecture that lecture that you can find here on the YouTube channel. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do options, a lot of different ways to do options. And, you know, I'm a big fan of what I call the options matrix. Please note, this is not a box with four squares. Somehow every one of these quadrants somehow relates to every other quadrant. And this options matrix is good for six of the nine option strategies you're held accountable for. All of the speculative option strategies. What I mean by that, 
speculative option strategies are where you might end up with the stock, but you don't start with the stock. You know, there's stock positions and option positions. So the six of them, those six are long call, short call, long put, short put. That's four of the six. And you can find that in lecture two on my YouTube channel, a whole hour of uh, basic option positions. You know, and uh, the matrix is very helpful. It also works for spreads because when you're spreading, whoop, when you're spreading, again, this works. What you're spreading is the difference in the premium. So a spread is when you're long and short a call or long and short a put, you know, in a straddle is when you're straddling that strike price line, as you see there in the matrix. So again, I'm not re-lecturing. Uh, that's a long straddle. You know, there's our arrow tool. And this is a short straddle. You know, if you get that matrix down, you're going to be in uh, pretty good shape for everything. And please note, it's a matrix. Here's our strike price. You know, I'll show you a, a straddle in a little bit that we're straddling or we're spreading in terms of that. So that uh, matrix is very helpful. So, you know, I recommend perhaps you want to give thought to having a matrix available for you. And I'll refer you to lecture two if you want to see how to develop that and how to use that. I'm just showing you things that you might want to have on your data dump sheet. That's the discussion we're having now. Uh, a great mnemonic, call up and put down. This uh, is a great mnemonic for break-evens. So for example, call up 138 is the break-even in that transaction. Call up. By the way, it doesn't matter whether the contract's long or short. It's a matter 138 and you either want it above or below that, depending on what side of that contract you're on. And then if Apple is anywhere above 130, that 130 call contract has intrinsic value. And put down is a great mnemonic. You know, the break-even here, put down, is 124 strike price less premium and if the apple contract if apple's trading anywhere below 130 those contracts have intrinsic value so that's a good one that's another good option one for you uh, cal is a reminder about how to do break evens cal and push in a spread and cal stands for call add to the lower so that's a reminder again a mnemonic about how we go about getting the break even in a spread now test taking trick even if you can't remember cal the break even in a spread is always between the two strikes. So you could toss out any choice that isn't between that range. I'll show that to you when we get into test taking tricks in a little bit. But the way we get to break even is we take the lower strike, 130, we add the net premium, doesn't matter what's a debit or credit, and we get our break even of 136 in this transaction. Push stands for put, subtract from the higher. So we're gonna take the higher strike, we're gonna subtract the net premium, we come to our break even of 134. Now, where you want the market price of Apple in relationship to that break-even depends on the dominant leg. And the dominant leg is always the one with the greater premium. It's always going to be the lower strike call. And so in this case, it's a short call that's dominant. And so we want it below that. Uh, here, the dominant leg, it'll always be the higher strike put. And that's, a, again, a bearish position as well. So that's where we want it in relationship to that. Uh, I haven't posted the lecture on multiple option strategies yet. It's in the can, but uh, I'm waiting. You know, I don't want my supply of lectures to exceed the demand for my lectures. And so I'm holding that one back, but that's uh, in the can ready to be published. So um, we'll see when it goes out to the, the world. Uh, maze your friends. So I can tell you whether any spread is bullish or bearish in two seconds, even if it's missing the premiums. And so this mnemonic stands for because you are long the lower strike. In any spread, if you are long the lower strike, you are a bull. So this is just a trick, again, a mnemonic. It works every time. Now, people who don't know that trick are going to think you're a genius because they're going to think when you say bull, bear, bull, bull, bear, bear. They're going to think what you're doing is looking at the premiums and reverse engineering the dominant leg, and you're already on you know, question 25. So just a trick. But it's a trick that works all the time. And so, you know, tricks are real well. I mean, nobody asks you how you got the right answer as long as you come up with the right answer, right? Again, some more tricks for spread. So I haven't posted the multiple option strategy yet, yeah, but do is a great mnemonic like Mountain Dew or Nike, just do it. In a debit spread, a debit spread is when you have more money out than money in. So that's a debit spread, 13 out and seven in. You want the contracts to exercise. Yes, indeed. I want somebody to stick it to me at 340. So I can stick it to the next guy at 360. So exercise is good. So when you understand that, you'll be right every time once you figure out debit. And then we want the difference in the premiums to get larger or widen. That's the hardest part to get is the idea of widen or narrow, but it's used on this monarch, you don't need to get it. If you get debit, exercise, widen, you'll be right every time. Those go together. I know what you can remember is when you're wide, 
like ding, you need to exercise. So just a mnemonic to help us in the spreads. Now, if on the other hand, we determine it's a credit spread, we got more money in than out, then we can use SIN. And that stands for credit expire narrow. That means in a credit spread, you want the contracts to expire so you can keep the money. You get to go neener, neener, neener. You agree to be a potential victim. Nobody victimizes you and you keep the money. And you want the difference in the premiums to get smaller or narrow. Hardest part to get, don't need to get, but it goes together all the time. Now, when I finally do post my multiple option strategy lecture or series seven top offs, registered option principles and mine sales supervisors, I will go out over that ad nauseum about what that means in terms of widening and narrow and, and how we go about solving for that. But for right now, this is a lecture just on some mnemonics, some tricks. Uh, silo. Silo is a mnemonic to help us uh, remember where we want uh, the stock to be in relationship to the break-evens. And that stands for short inside, long outside. So as you see here, here's the market price of the stock. Here's the market price of the stock. And uh, here's my straddle. And so what I'm straddling is 130. Let me get a different color here. And so, you know, I've got 12 points that I can work with here, six and six, right? And so where I want the Apple to be here is in between these two break-evens. Ideally, I want Apple to be, you know, 12, 142, and uh, where's my calculator? I'm not good at arithmetic, so 130 minus 12, 118. So uh, that silo is just a mod to help us remind us where we want the uh, uh, straddle to be, or the market price to be. This is an Apple straddle. It's a short Apple straddle. So I want Apple between 142 and 118, ideally 130. So now if it's a long straddle, and here's a long straddle, again, here's our market price. You know, I need to cover my out-of-pocket cost. Same break-evens, by the way. Right, and now I want it to be, I want Apple to be above 142 or below 118. So that's just a mnemonic to help us remember where we want this to be in relationship to that. You remember in straddles, we have uh, four, uh, we have two break evens, four things we gotta be able to do on the test. Again, I'm not lecturing straddles, but you gotta be able to identify a straddle. You gotta be able to calculate the break evens. You gotta determine where it's profitable and when do you use it. Uh, Epic, you know, be careful if you have any kind of international perspective because the test assumes that everything is, revolves around the US. And so be careful, this is about US exporters. So if I'm a US exporter, I buy puts. It's just a mnemonic to help us remember that, right? If I'm Boeing and I'm selling my planes in Japan, you know, I'm afraid that the yen is going to get weak. And so, you know, when I turn the yen into dollars, I don't get as many of them. And so what I would do is do something in the uh, options market that would offset that. And so hopefully I buy some yen puts and for, it won't be a perfect hedge, but, you know, we're hoping that I'll make up in that uh, long put what I might lose in that exchange. Now, if I import uh, European wine, for example, uh, I'm not afraid that the dollar is strong and I end up coming back with more European wine. I'm afraid that, uh, you know, the dollar is weak. Now, I'm not being facetious on this test. The dollar is not a foreign currency. And so what I'm afraid of is the euro in this case is going to go up. And so I would buy a call in the euro and hopefully the profit there would offset whatever loss I have in the uh, spot market. All right, let's talk about some test taking tricks. Uh, you know, I'm going to go through all these with you. Read the full question, RTFQ, and read the full answer set, chop the answer set. Uh, sometimes we might want to read the last sentence first. That's always a good thing to do if it's a long one. Uh, dealing with different test phraseology where, you know, I know I know the answer, but it's not avail available to me. So I got to you know, take a strategic pause, show you a couple of those. Process of elimination, I should show you a couple of those. Going to show you a reduction to the ridiculous, which is a test taking trick where I take the answer to the nth degree. And if it can't sustain itself intellectually, it's not right. Uh, one of my all time favorites, the Sesame Street trick. One of these tricks, uh, one of these things is not like the other. And then another thing you might want to do is write a T or F next to each answer and see if you can go about it that way. Now, if you're going to use some of these, you're going to need your scratch paper. You get two official sheets of scratch paper, assuming you're doing the traditional prometric site version of this thing. All right, so here's our first one. Here's our first one. So it says here, the company issues stock. The stock is junior to the bondholders in liquidation. And the stockholders will only receive a dividend if declared by the board of directors. Now, if I stop there and don't read the full sentence, the full question, I might think it's A. But then it says the stock has no voting rights. And so now I know it's B. So you got to be careful that you don't jump on an answer too quickly uh, before you read the full question. Uh, here's another one where we're reading the full answer set. We're shopping the answer set. 
So again, if I don't read the full answer set, I might jump a little too quick and I might miss this. How are securities issued by a municipality treated for tax purpose? Now, A sounds pretty good, but you know, don't throw rocks at Dean here, but I'm allowed on the test to mark you wrong for right answers if there was a better answer available and you didn't take it. You got to come up with the most appropriate answer. So sometimes a lot of times you get to the 50-50 and you go, boy, both those sound right. And I'm telling you, they both could be right. And you're still going to get marked wrong if you don't come up with the best answer. So without reading the full answer set here, I might think A is the, uh, the answer, but I want to see if there's something perhaps better. The interest they pay is fully taxed. Well, that's not true. I know that I can get rid of that one. The interest they pay is not taxed at the local, state, or federal level. That looks like it's the same thing as C here. But, you know, to be honest with you, I can't answer A or C without determining suitability. Without knowing where you live and what kind of bond you're going to buy, all I can tell you is D. So D would be the appropriate response here, not A and not C. So there's an example where you got to read the full answer set. And then based on that, say, okay, what is the best answer given this answer set? Uh, read the last sentence first. Oh my goodness, here's a whole paragraph, right? Uh, you know, uh, I'm just going to read the last sentence first. Which of the following stocks would be resilient to the business cycle? Thank you very much. A defensive stock, right? I got that. I don't need to read the whole paragraph. That's a defensive stock. But you know, let's go back now and read the entire paragraph. A customer is worried about how the declining business cycle may affect the stock portfolio. The customer wishes to have own some stocks that would be able to deliver products and services. The consumers cannot delay purchasing. Which of the following stocks would be resilient to the business cycle? And you know, I'm going to give you a choice of A, cyclical, B, defensive, and you, know, you got to come up with defensive. But uh, that becomes a lot more manageable. You read that last sentence first. I also like that, by the way, because then you know where the paragraph leads. Sometimes these questions get so wordy that by the time you get to the bottom, you can't remember <laughs> what the question was. So sometimes that's helpful as well. Uh, I struggle with this one all the time. You know, I know this, I know I know this. I think it was assets minus liabilities equals net worth. And so now I'm confronted with that isn't one of my choices. And so Dean has to take a strategic pause and say, okay, now this is what I call a champagne problem. A champagne problem is not a real problem that you've studied so hard and you're locked into a certain phraseology, whether it's STC's phraseology or Kaplan's phraseology or whoever's phraseology and you see a difference. So then I got to stop back up and say, okay, well, that's the same thing as that. So every once in a while you get a question where you go, man, I know I know this and you're still struggling. So that's a good solution to that problem. Uh, process of elimination. You know, the gain and the loss, the gain and the loss in a spread always equals the difference in the strikes. So whatever these two numbers are, they have to add up to 10. So I can immediately get rid of this one and I can immediately get rid of this one, right? I can eliminate. Now here I'm to a 50-50, but that's still better than one in four. Right, so process and elimination is saying, okay, well, what ones in this answer set, what can I get rid of right away? You know, and so here, by the way, this is also a test taking trick I just shared with you in any spread, the gain loss always equals the difference in the strikes. Uh, by the way, this one is a gain of seven because it's a credit spread and loss of three, but you could, by the way, maybe this one isn't, doesn't add up to 10, in which case you could have just got rid of that, right? So. Uh, the breaking even has to lie somewhere between again, you know, op, you know, spreads are all about floors and ceilings and there's a floor here at 130 and there's a ceiling at 140. And so wherever that breaking even is, it's somewhere between 130 and 140. So I can get rid of that one. I can get rid of that one. And I can get rid of that one. Now it would be preferable that you actually knew that you're going to add the net premium to lower strike, but you know, good test takers sometimes don't have to work as hard when they're applying their test taking tricks. Uh, reduction of the ridiculous is again, where we take an answer and we say, if this were true, what would the world look like? So choice D says, if the miner dies before the stipulated age, the assets go to the custodian. Well, reduction of ridiculous says that would lead to a world in which custodians are killing miners to get the assets. You know, and that can't possibly be true because of reduction to the ridiculous. So that's where I go to the answer set and say, okay, well, if this answer is true, and I reduce it to the ridiculous, does the world, does it sustain itself? And can that really be a world that is intellectually coherent? If not, it can't be truthful. It can't be a correct answer. Now be careful, this is an accept, so you gotta be real careful on those. Uh, the principle of mutual exclusion. So mutual exclusion means I know the answer here is either A or B because they say mutually exclusive things. It can't be both higher and lower in the same universe. Right, Socrates is a dog. Socrates is a philosopher. He's either a dog or a philosopher. He can't be both. 
So that means I don't need to need to burn up brain cells on C and D. I'm either going to take A or B. And now I got to be careful again on the accept. So they're asking me, what is uh, not truthful? What is false? And what's false is a convertible that has a higher coupon. No, no, no. It has a lower coupon. So that's a, that's a good one, is to, a good trick as well, right? You get two answers that are mutually exclusive. They can't both be true in the same universe, and you know it's got to be one of the two, even though there are four offers of answers to you. Uh, I love this one. This is called the Sesame Street trick. One of these things is not like the other. Taxes, 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 fees. Now, again, remember, we only use test-taking tricks when all else fails. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't learn this information. I would prefer that you actually know the right answer, but when all else fails, uh, you know, Sesame Street trick is a good one. Uh, here's another one. Here, I didn't bother to come up with a question. It's just this one is different. So, you know, I like that one just because of the Sesame Street. That may or may not be the right answer, but remember, as we said, we're only using test taking tricks when all else fails. Maybe I'll make up the a question. Maybe it says, uh, which of the following has a direct relationship with inflation? Which of the following has a direct relationship with inflation? Maybe that's the answer. And then, you know, this is A, B, C, D. Uh, true or false? Generally speaking, non-qualified plans. So we put a T or an F, and then we figure out what the T's and F's are. Maybe I can't do all the T's and our F's, but generally speaking, I go, oh, I know that's true. And, you know, generally speaking, non-qualified funds of plans like a variable annuity are funded with after-tax dollars. And so maybe I can't get that. I know that's false. I mean, that's why it's non-qualified because you didn't do any of that stuff and you can discriminate. So, you know, maybe I just go right down to the T or, you know, whatever I want to do. All right. So I, that was a little, I'm pretty proud of myself. As I think it looks like the first time I've kept a, a lecture you know, on a reasonable uh, time frame. As I mentioned, uh, this is just a buffet. So some people believe in doing a data dump sheet. Some people do not. If I told you you could have one sheet of paper with it, anything front and back you want, what would be on that? Everybody would be a little different. But if you did that every night before you went to bed, every morning when you woke up, that's when your brain is at its best. By between now and test time, you'd be able to do that. Now you have to start the clock when you go down there. I'm a believer in, if no other reason to do the data dump sheet is, I think it's a good way to get your circadian rhythm going. Most people don't wake up in the morning going series seven. So the other, I think useful, maybe it's a placebo effect, but another useful thing about having a data dump sheet is it gets your brain thinking, okay, I'm here to take series seven. So I gave you some ideas for your uh, data dump sheet. I'm sure there's some more we could think of if we uh, put our minds to it. Uh, we said recognition questions lend themselves perhaps to a data dump sheet, like regulations and the uniform practice code. Uh, you might want to have certain formulas available to you. Uh, I like to use my formulas if I'm going to do a data dump sheet in an area I need them, but some people just like to have a, a you know, formula page. And you're definitely going to have to do current yield on your exam. That's what an investment pays you by what it costs you. I just had a candidate tell me that got them a couple answers as they couldn't remember what to do. P.S. I would add that most of the series seven math is division. And so if you can't remember what to do on your test, take the first number and divide it by the second number. That takes care of about 90% of series seven math. So, you know, I'd be doing you a favor to cover up your calculator keys, except the divide key. Uh, definitely make sure you know how to calculate parity of both the bond and the stock. Uh, make sure you know the formula for taxable and tax-free equivalent yields. Uh, make sure you got your break-evens. Now, if you do my options lecture, you don't need to memorize any break-evens because I practice what's called a T, money out versus money in. And I can always get the break-even by just shopping the answer set and putting it in there. But if you're going to memorize break-evens, that's fine. But make sure you have memorized them correctly and you can data dump them. Uh, I would definitely have my classical margin equations available. Uh, long market value minus debit equals equity for my long margin account and credit register minus short market value equals equity uh, on my short account. Again, this isn't exhaustive, just some suggestions of things to kind of, uh, you know, maybe inspire your brain, fire up your brain housing group a little bit. And then the point of this lecture was to give you some ideas for some mnemonics, as well as give you some test taking tricks. And so those were some of the mnemonics that we went over to in uh, today's lecture. And then you might want to assert your notes, you know, whether you have notes you've been taking as you've been watching lectures or reading your book or whatever you've been doing, going to class, you know, you want to scour your notes and see what you might find there that would be good fodder uh, for a data dump sheet. So hope you think that would, I hope you found that helpful. Uh, this is not a normally scheduled uh, lecture. Like I said, I'm putting it up just because somebody asked about it and it was, it's ready to go. So I said, why not? I'll put it up here. Um, the next lectures that will be coming and post, I try and post weekly to the YouTube channel is going to either, either be types of orders or multiple option strategies. I haven't quite decided which one. But anyways, uh, uh, bon chance, mon ami, on your Series 7, and uh, let me know what happens.